Well, it's my great privilege and great pleasure to be back again at a meeting of like-minded hearts and minds in a place that's special and for the first time in Colorado Springs. I think this will give us an opportunity to anchor a new field. And my topic today is fields, physics, and subtle energies. I dedicate this lecture to Nikola Tesla, who worked here 104 years ago. And I sense his spirit is with us still today. He generated energies at high frequencies, low amperage, that literally lit up the human body from the outside through corona discharge. I'd also like to point out over here, you can see on the bottom, there might be hard to see from the back, somewhere over here, there is Venus transiting over the sun that just took place for the first time in 130 years on, July, uh, on June the 8th this year. And the interesting thing about this was that when Venus was at its south node 243 years ago, just like it was in this year, was the first time that scientists from all over uh, Europe went all over the world to measure the distance uh, to the sun. And they did this by triangulation, by measuring the time it would take Venus to transit over the disk of the sun, weather permitting. And from that, we derived our first yardstick of how we, our place in the universe, our distance for, to the sun was determined as an astronomical unit, 93 million miles, and it was an amazing feat. And so I hope that as a result of that, a new collaboration 243 years ago uh, again, will take place like 243 years ago, so that we may develop a new field of energy medicine and integrate it into all the other scientific minds that have gone before. The lecture today will talk about the current revolution in matter and energy, why quantum physics may be important to energy medicine, waves and their historical development, and the concept of fields and where that came from, some of the limitations of our current electromagnetism, the mystery of the human biofield and potentials, what scalar and vector fields are, and the importance of water to store all that as information. Now there's, how, how, how should we do this in about 60 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's gonna be a fast paced presentation. I hope to show you in as many pictures to make it as accessible to the widest audience possible. Because the essence of science is the search for truth, beauty, and ultimately goodness. And if science can also be understood with the heart, and motivate the noblest aspirations in our culture, then it's time to rethink some of our science. And that's what's going on right now. Back in 1981, I was privileged to be part of the American Medical Research Expedition to Mount Everest. And that was a place where I experienced an inordinate amount of calm. There was no electromagnetic pollution there, except what we created through our radio communications to base camp. And it led to an amazing spiritual awakening. Then I saw I had a vision what would happen 25 years later. And here we are, 23 years later after that date. And I recognized just really one universal river of truth, mostly undiscovered, yet many scientific wells that dig down to this river that is under the ground in the collective unconscious. And it's our task to create scientific theories which are only that, scientific theories, hypotheses that are forever tested and revised, because there is really no ultimate scientific truth, but a contemporary set of theories with which humanity tries to understand its place in the universe. Science deals with the demonstrable, yet the perennial wisdom deals with the ineluctable, or that which is self-evident and will be revealed over time. This is a baby picture of the universe last year released by NASA. The universe at 380,000 years old. From that, we figured out that the Big Bang occurred 13.7 billion years ago. But what's unusual about all of this new research is that for the first time we understood that what we can see and all our theories are based on is only 4% or less of the, of the universe, because that's all that's visible. You see, 23% of the universe is dark matter, which we don't even know what it is, so we call it dark. It's as yet to be illumined by light. And 73% of the universe is dark energy. So we literally live in a universe of energy, and quantum physicists and astrophysicists are now trying to discern what is this really all about. So good news for us. If only everything we base our theories on is 2% of what's known, there's lots of room for discovery. 
<laughs> when we look at our universe, quantum physicists look at the microcosm, the atomic quantum effects, and now it's expanded to string theory to also include the macrocosmic effect where we look at gravity and black holes. But if you plot all of the matter that we have understood or observed logarithmically, you can see it falls along a straight line. And in the middle stands man, the human being, as the balance between the macrocosm and the microcosm. Of course, all of our energy comes from the sun. Ultimately, it's the flow of electrons in the universe. It's the flow of energy in the form of particles we can only describe by probability functions and by waves. And this is what I want to talk about, how the universe is really energy and where that energy came from. Well, ever since Albert Einstein mentioned that energy and mass uh, times the speed of light squared are equivalent, so mass and energy are equivalent related to the speed of light. We need to understand again what matter is. Well, matter primarily is an inner and an outer. It's sort of a yin and yang thing. The inside of matter is quarks, which make up the nucleus according to the standard model of the universe. They work in triangles, and they obey the strong force because they hold the center, you might say, of the inner gravity of our atoms together. And the outside is leptons, which are the field around the nucleus. Leptons are light particles. They're mostly electrons and heavy electrons. And again, they work in the trinity to create this beautiful star of David. So here are quarks. Quarks are up and down quarks as the first line. And these are primarily what make up protons and neutrons, the primary stuff of our atomic nucleus. They are balanced by electrons, and they're perhaps partner in the dance, which are called neutrinos. Every electron is coupled to a neutrino. And this is the primary axis upon which all this matter, which is mostly invisible, most of it is empty space filled with fields. This is what we're made up. On the next level, we get to something heavier as a particle called the charm and the strange quark, also the center and sideways quark. And that's balanced by the muon, a heavy electron, and its counteracting neutrino in the second generation of electrons. These only exist for 2.2 millionth of a second, 2.2 microseconds. And then the third level is top and bottom quarks, also called truth and beauty, by scientists who are searching for this beautiful model. And that's balanced by the tau particle and its, cons its neutrino partner. And they only exist for... Um, three times, uh, one, one tenth of a billionth of a billionth of a second. They're very heavy, but they're gone in the blink of a universal instant. The heaviest, of course, is truth. Not surprising. <laughs> the heaviest particle or the top quark. And nowadays, scientists are trying to bring together super string theories, which sees the universe as complex vibrating strings, because we couldn't integrate <coughs> even though Einstein tried very hard the theory of gravity into everything. So we have to bring new dimensions into this. And now we're up to 11 dimensions in string theory, or M theory, standing for mystery, perhaps. Nobody knows what M stands for, but this is the latest theory. And so we have vibrations, as Harold yesterday invoked, and harmony as the basis of the universe. So in order to make things symmetrical on this higher level, concepts such as supersymmetry have been invoked to try to bring dark matter and dark energy into the model. And for that, we need new partners in this dance, theoretical particles called the selectron or super electron and the super neutrino or S neutrino and the neutralino. And so we are right now at a stage where physics is being rethought just as it was 100 years ago, as it seems to go in cycles of 100 years. We're penetrating deeper in. Is space empty? No, empty is not the case. It's just not empty. Uh, it's empty of particles, perhaps, because the universe is filled with a field in the standard model. It's called the Higgs field, even though the Higgs particle has not been found yet. And elementary particles are destroyed and arise in the fraction of a blink of a universal instant. And this is called the quantum dance or the universal foam or Dirac's sea of energy. And we are literally the flotsam and jetsam in this zero-point energy domain. We are the quantum foam. We exist and disappear, as in the East was called the dance of Shiva, the dance of creation and destruction that occurs simultaneously 
our consciousness is just too slow, so we think we are continuous sitting in these chairs thinking our ego is who we are. We are really recreating each other in the field of constant interactions. Well, one of the persons who was a visionary and Jim Oshman's mentor was Albert Zen Georgi, who in 1968 said, I'm deeply sure that we will never be able to understand the essence of life if we restrict ourselves to the molecular model. And here was a physicist uh, and a biologist and a biophysicist who discovered vitamin C, understood the energetic basis of life. He said, a surprising subtlety of biological reactions is stipulated by the mobility of electrons and can be explained only from the position of quantum mechanics. These slides are put in to slow me down from time to time. <laughs> And I got a lot of guidance yesterday. I tend to go a little fast, but we're trying to create a field together. <laughs> so what is quantum physics? Then it's important to understanding energy medicine because we are holographically resonant, non-linearly interactive beings. Wow, there's a mouthful. And we communicate with coherent light of biophotons. And we are interconnected by a unified field. But unfortunately, our current medicine is more based on a Newtonian way of looking at life and older forces. And we need to get into a new model. So in medicine, we use three types of communications in the body. Letter mail or snail mail is essentially our drug system, our hormonal system, our neurotransmitters. We use lab tests to figure out what the molecules are doing. This is the biochemical model of medicine. Then we discovered the electrophysiological method of medicine, where we think of things like wireless trans or wire transmissions, telegraphy, computer networks, and telephones. These are the action potentials that travel over your nerves and autonomic nervous system. We put electrodes on each other to wire each other up to measure these electrical potentials and fields. And finally, we also communicate by radio waves and radiation. This takes place in the matrix, in the connective tissue matrix, the cellular matrix. It uses light, it uses biophotons, and we measure that nowadays with nuclear magnetic resonances and PET scans and so on. This is a bioenergetic thing, and this is more what we're trying to move towards. And I'm going to suggest there's even another level behind that, as we'll see, that is much more at a quantum level. Well, we like to understand things in linear ways, and this are analysis of linear systems, screws and bicycles and windmills. And then we get more complex linear systems, but still predictable. So we create cars and airplanes and cellular phones and so on. But they all have finite solutions, and they can be calculated and predicted. This is very useful for creating our modern world, but it just may not be applicable so much to biological and living systems. Because when you take these ideas and these energies and apply them to living systems, you can have all kinds of different responses. So we have to have statistical ways of analyzing things because we are essentially nonlinear beings. And nonlinear beings behave differently and not predictably. They have differential equations that are not necessarily having finite solutions. Nowadays, we have a growing electromagnetic hazards with all kinds of radiation in the environment, as I'll show you. And because we're nonlinear beings, scientists can't agree whether these things are hazardous or not, because we're still using linear ways to say this is hazardous or not. But many people who are very sensitive respond to these very exquisitely, uniquely, uh, powerfully, and get affected negatively by some of this technology. Because, you see, biological systems are nonlinear, have an extreme sensitivity that can't be explained by traditional biophysics. In fact, cells sometimes act like Josephson superconductors. They can actually pick up single magnetic quanta of uh, flux, magnetic flux or light. They communicate through light. They resonate through nonlinear things like plasma waves generated in inert gas, as we'll see tomorrow from some of the equipment. And water and cells respond to also non-classical electromagnetic fields. In fact, Cyril Smith found that uh, we could think of living systems as literally macroscopic quantum systems. And quantum systems are thought to only act at the atomic level. We actually have many quantum processes taking place in our body, and primarily on the cell membrane over here, because the cell membrane is literally something like um, having several million receptors on every cell of your body to the 300 or odd chemical messenger molecules, whether they're hormones or neurotransmitters or cytokines. 
And the model used to be a lock and key model. You know, in comes a chemical molecule, triggers a receptor like putting a lock, a key into a lock. But nowadays we find that it's really much more of a quantum process. It's really more like a flickering flame. It's really like an instantaneous energetic resonance transfer that takes place. And that communicates then with a connective tissue matrix, which Jim Oshman has told us many times about, is literally a field of communication, a communication through light, electromagnetic, and other nonlinear uh, coherent light processes. It acts like a liquid crystal, a semiconductor, uh, and it's fractally interconnected where the part and the whole are in a dance together. Every cell of your body is connected to every other cell, not just through the chemical molecules. So to understand that, we need to go into waves. The waves are, say that everything vibrates and a wave has an amplitude and a phase relative to a reference and it has a wavelength or the inverse of that, a frequency. And if we see that everything is based on spin, we can see, as you see on the bottom there, the phase continues to go around uh, in a 360 degree rotation or dance and that's how we create these beautiful sine waves, which are the linear way of showing rotary motion. Every wave also is uh, composed of many harmonics because we don't see very pure sine waves very often. For example, a square wave here is composed of many odd harmonics, and a sawtooth wave that looks like that is composed of all the harmonics, but you can see the higher harmonics fall off very rapidly from the fundamental frequency. Waves, of course, interferes. Every child who's tossed two pebbles into a pond has recognized they create these beautiful interference patterns. And they can either cancel each other out, that's called destructive interference, or add up, called constructive interference. And waves travel with a phase velocity past each other. And when they hit just the right amount of resonance together, you can see they kind of look like real particles. They're almost standing still, modulated waves that result, and this is the way quantum physicists think of things. Well, back in 1803, Thomas Young started looking at light, and he saw that when you put light through two slits, it created these interference patterns, just like the waves on the pond, and so he surmised that light had to be a wave, although Newton had thought that light was a particle. And so then came a great controversy in science, how to bring them together. So we have to ask now, what are really fields? because this is the subject matter today. Fields are really both mathematical constructs and ways to theorize about forces acting in space or action at a distance. And for that, in the past, the ether had been invoked. That was a mechanical analogy, the mechanical or luminiferous ether through which forces could act because we were used to mechanics at that time. Well, fields are created like when we have electrical discharges, or we have tremendous changes that take place all the time. We're all in fields, and the person who gave us this concept was Michael Faraday 160 years ago. In a 19, an 1844 lecture to the Royal Society in Britain, he introduced this concept which was qualitative because he wasn't a mathematician, he was a visionary. He saw it in his mind's eye, and he said there has to be something called fields. In fact, we now know that physics measures everything by forces because the only thing we can ever measure is forces. And we have forces of gravity or forces in the atomic area, which are strong and weak forces, or electromagnetic forces. And these forces obey Newton's second law, can be worked with with differential equations, and ultimately we use that to try to explain the universe. Physics has these four forces, and I just want to point out here that they're not all the same in strength. In fact, the strong force is 137 times stronger than the electromagnetic force, but the weak force, which is studied through quantum function dynamics, is the weak nuclear force that is responsible for decay of uh, atomic matter. That's 10 to the minus 11, or you know, about two bil a billion billion times weaker. And then gravity is 10 to the minus 36. It's the weakest of them all, so we have to bring uh, ways together that are quite different in intensity or in in uh, energy, so they interact differently. And the main thing we're gonna talk about today is electromagnetic, because that's basically what most of us are most interacting with and that is most active. That's called quantum electrodynamics. Well, Michael Faraday, going back to him in the Victorian era, gave us electromagnetic rotation, electromagnetic induction. He studied electrochemistry. 
He studied dia and paramagnetism of all the elements. He gave us electrostatic induction, and he contemplated and said there is something that interconnects everything. It's called lines of force. So we can see it over here. He said, a compass needle vibrates by gathering upon itself because it's magnetic conduction and polarity a certain amount of lines of force which would otherwise traverse the space around it. So every particle literally creates a field around itself that can move and is adaptive to the other field forces in the universe. And here we can see his law of electromagnetic induction. You can see if you take a magnet which has its own donut shaped a toroidal field moving through a coil of wire, it sets up in the coil as seen over here also, uh, a self-induction, as you can see, sort of the lines of force created in the coil as it moves around. So this is how electromagnetic forces interact in part. Well, it took James Clerk Maxwell, who was born the same day as Faraday discovered the law of electromagnetic induction, to put this into a theoretical and mathematical framework, because he was really the scientist as a magician. He was the 19th century greatest theoretical physicist, and he wrote about all the laws that were then understood about electricity and magnetism and gathered them together, writing 20 or so equations, many of them in a hyperdimensional mathematics called quaternion notation. And these equations, unfortunately, were later revised to make them more user-friendly. And in that, we threw out something of the baby with the bathwater, as I'll show you. <laughs> But Maxwell gave us the first unified field theory ever invented in physics, and that was the theory of electromagnetism, which was wonderful because it brought together Gauss's law of electricity, which has to do with charges and surfaces, and that there weren't any magnetic monopoles, that there's always a north and south magnet working together, that Faraday's law of induction I just showed you, and Ampere's law, which he modified, now called the Ampere-Maxwell law. Well, he used these complex numbers, which had both a scalar component and a vector component, using a mathematics that was invented by uh, William Rowan Hamilton back in 1858, and that he had this great epiphany while walking under an Irish bridge one day, and he was so happy, and Maxwell adopted this and said, this is wonderful, this will explain how we can write these complex fields and create a theory that's coherent. But that was later on simplified into something called vector analysis, which every engineer and physicist learns about by Gibbs and Heaviside. And so the scalar component kind of left, because we come quaternions were very difficult to work with. Vector analysis made it easy. William uh, uh, or um, Josiah Williard Gibbs was an American, studied a lot of thermodynamics, but he really brought the vectors that uh, Maxwell had worked with into a more user-friendly way. And so he was sort of the Maxwell of America, you might say. And he worked with this eccentric English telegraph operator called Oliver Heaviside, who was an interesting man, cavorting around in nightgowns in his house and very eccentric, didn't like to go to meetings. But he is the one that gave us... <laughs> His, his story is fascinating. You might want, want to read it in a minute. I'll show you a book. Oliver Heaviside really created the equations we now call Maxwell's equations. They used to be first called Heaviside Hertz equations because Hertz, the Greek, gave us the first uh, electromagnetic uh, field transmission in Germany, and Heaviside worked together, and they simplified these equations. And with that, something happened that I'll show you is very important for a biological system. Well, Paul Nahin wrote a book about that called Oliver Heaviside, uh, The Life, Work, and um, Times of an Electrical Genius in the Victorian Age. So here's sort of the lineage where we've gotten to. Uh, Faraday and Hamilton both inspired Maxwell, who gave us the first electromagnetic field theory, and then was simplified by Gibbs and especially by Heaviside. And so we now had these equations, these four equations that are traditionally called Maxwell's equations. But notice that these equations leave something out, and that is called the magnetic vector potential. And I'll show you that's very important biologically. It's also called the A field. But we get a heart of the story because first we have to see how quantum physics started to fit into this. Well, quantum physics arose because people wanted to study how energy was radiated from hot bodies. And the hotter you make a body, the different the color gives off. But there were some problems, which I won't go into. And it took then something that Max Planck, about in the year 1900, 
got some basic insight and he said that energy really isn't given off continuously, otherwise we would have this ultraviolet catastrophe in the universe. So it has to be given off in packets of energy or quanta. And that was totally revolutionary because everything is continuous, is it not? And yet here, just like our consciousness skipping a beat, so does energy. Energy constantly moves in packets of energy. Not only that, that energy is related by frequency. It's proportional to frequency. And the constant of proportionality is called Planck's constant, named after him. He also made this famous statement, a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather <laughs> because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that's familiar with it. <laughs> well, we, since we're talking about energy here, we have to talk about how energy and quantum physics fits together. And it basically has to do with the time derivatives of the moment of inertia. Moment of inertia is basically mass times length squared. And when you take the time derivative, in other words, apply moment of inertia over unit time, you got a quantum of action, or ml uh, squared divided by t. And this is also uh, connected to Planck's constant. This is also connected with angular momentum, if you do the math of that. And energy is then the time derivative of quanta. And they're given off in quanta. And this is also then connected to power, because power is the time derivative of energy. Oops, I think we just hit a button. Let's see if we can, there we are. OK, so power. Power is the time derivative of uh, energy. So we have energy per unit time applied. And this is what the electricity company charges you for, the power. Well, to make it more user friendly, we could say, uh, metaphorically, faith is the moment of inertia. We all are incarnated, and we have a certain faith. But it can also be a certain unconsciousness initially, so we have to go on faith. And then we get spin, or we get impulse, and that's freedom. That's really what quanta are. It's the freedom to be spiritually active in incarnation. That leads to work. That's called the work of incarnation, the work of spiritual enlightenment. That could be called torque. Sometimes it torques us out. Or it could be called work. <laughs> And that ultimately leads to knowledge, which is power. And that would be the analogy. And ultimately, we hope it becomes wisdom. Well, waves can resonate not just along a straight line, as we've seen, but they can also resonate circularly. And this is how Louis de Broglie, back in 1923, started looking at electrons and developing things. Because just as kettle drums can vibrate, so can uh, electrons in their orbits, as they were then hypothesized to be a little bit like planets. And they have resonances within them. And when energy moves from one frequency or one level, as you can see in the upper left there, they all, each orbit has a different frequency resonance. And when we move from one level to another, energy is given off or absorbed. And this is the basis of electromagnetism applied at the atomic level. So when a photon, which is a carrier, of electromagnetic force, not just visible light, but on any part of the electromagnetic spectrum, hits an orbit or a state or a resonance of an electron at a certain level, or when it drops to a lower level, it gives off light. This is studied in physics through spectroscopy, which are the different lines by which light is given off. And it can be in the ultraviolet light area, on the visible light, on the infrared. This is what our basic spectroscopy is about, jumping electrons from energy level to energy level in quanta. Okay, And when it does that, it gives off a field. And that field is radiated in the far field to be composed of an electric field, here shown vertically, and a magnetic field. And this is really a field of vectors that moves. And you can visualize the electromagnetic wave as being up and down going magnetic and electric vectors. But we'll get into a little bit about vector physics in a minute. But it's just nice to visualize what these fields look like when they're radiated. And there are millions and billions and trillions of these fields going through this room right now. And they all look like that. They're kind of budding off. This is sort of a slow motion of something that your cell phone does at 2.4 gigahertz. Or I say 2 gigahertz. Your microwave oven goes at 2.4 gigahertz. So, Dolphins have a better time at this. They just swim through the water and communicate through phase relationships through their chatter. And they have a whole different way to have a brain working in a different way. 
Well, the electromagnetic spectrum now is considered being all different electrons moving fast or slow from the lowest in brain waves and power line frequencies to radio waves to microwaves right up there to visible light, x-rays and beyond. And you can see at different frequencies, molecules either spin or rotate or vibrate or jump from electron shell to electron shell, which takes place at the higher frequencies. And we have harnessed this to create lasers, which can also be used to imprint bioinformation in the system. And a laser is characterized compared to a standard vibration because there is a longer length of vibration for a longer period of time. It's called a longer coherence length, whereas a light bulb has a much shorter coherence length. So it scatters its energy in all directions. And it's like a focused meditator maintaining an asana of longer meditation. That is sort of the laser mind, like nature of your mind. Well, the DNA in your body has many regions in which there is non-coding. In fact, the genome in your DNA is only about one and a half to three percent, they haven't quite figured out. The other 97 percent they used to call junk DNA. But of course, the body doesn't use junk. It just uses that other part of the DNA, according to the German physicist, biophysicist like Fritz Popp, to communicate through light. And that the DNA could be thought of as a light store in a certain way. And in fact, when cells are healthy, they don't give off much light. But when the cells start to become cancerous, they don't communicate so well. And you can actually measure the light given off. And you can differentiate cells depending on how much light they leak, whether they're healthy or sick. Nowadays, we actually use light to treat cancer and many other illnesses. And we'll talk more about that tomorrow. But what's important from an energy perspective is also that microwaves can be absorbed by DNA. And just to show you, if you stretch out DNA linearly, it resonates to the same frequency as our microwave oven and our cell phones. And we may have to be concerned that there may be not more DNA breakages with that. And DNA aren't just linear, but they coil up. The DNA coils up like these super coils. And even these super coils are very much affected by microwave radiation. And you can see our microwave oven and cordless cell phones all have certain resonant peaks. And if you're unlucky, you may have some necessary, unnecessary potential resonances that might lead to some illness. Anyway, our electromagnetic spectrum has changed in the last 100 years tremendously. At the bottom, you can see how 100 years ago, we only heard the Earth's natural magnetic field. We had lightning creating electrical fields and ma uh, magnetic fields, and we had visible light. But now we filled it all up, courtesy of the FCC in this country. And now we can communicate at any frequency. And we live in a new electromagnetic sea. Wouldn't it be nice to go back to the Patala for a minute and uh, sit in, as I did in Mount Everest and not be in all these waves. Well, let's talk about the biofield for a minute. Traditionally, people have tried to understand it in terms of electromagnetics. But electromagnetic equations don't incorporate potentials, as I've showed you. And they may need to be seen in a more of a quantum sense, because biological systems are nonlinear. But our analysis tended to be primarily more linear. Just to show you that this is really effective, in Russia, there was a man called Chang Kaziang who did experiments just with fields, where he took a, uh, something and say, on the left, the transmitter uh, chamber, and then moved it through some kind of resonator. It looks like a Star Trek-like device he's holding in his hand, and imprinted, say, duck eggs onto chicken uh, or ducks he put into a chamber and imprinted their information, bioinformation, onto chicken eggs. And when they hatched, they were chickens with genetically modified feet. They had webbed feet, or he imprinted wheat on corn and created new hybrid strains, all without any slicing and dicing uh, genetic engineering approaches. So fields can be very powerful and may modify our genome. So we have to then go into a larger model of what the human biofield is. This is based on a model proposed here and in other places by Glenn Ryan, a good friend and colleague. And he suggested that we might want to not only look at electromagnetic force fields, which are what we measure traditionally here shown in green, but also look at potential fields, scalar and vector potentials, which have now been shown to be real ever since 1959's experiment by Aharonov and Bohm. And these are embedded in turn in even a larger field called the quantum fields. And this is David Bohm, the physicist. He suggested that outside of the explicit order, which are measurable electromagnetic fields, there's an implicit order, 
I might suggest that's analogous to potential fields of the scalar and vector potential. And embedded in that, or even larger, is superimplicate orders, which might be the quantum potentials. So what are these quantum fields that exist in the zero-point energy domain or the vacuum? And what are quantum potentials? Quantum potentials are basically like voltages, which are electrical potentials, but they're related to wave functions, where we have the Schrodinger wave function in the numerator and the denominator. And it's essentially the shape of information rather than the amplitude or power or strength of it. It's maybe seen analogous to this experiment. If you have a quantum potential and you put an electron through a two-split kind of um, uh, set up like this, then you will have interference patterns just like we had with light. And here are all the tr possible trajectories shown on the right that an electron can get from A to B. But the mathematical potential function is shown on the left. It's kind of like the guiding spirit of the electron, knowing where it has to travel on its journey. So we could say the quantum potential is analogous to a radio wave that would be received by a ship. It has its own energy to steer along, and it gives it directions. And it only interacts when the particle interacts with the quantum potential. So it can have many different shapes. And so every particle is part of the field and interacting in this quantum potential possibility. Um, the potential fields themselves are a little closer to what we can get to measuring. And we have had potential theories for several hundred years. Many people from Lagrange to Laplace to Kirchhoff has talked about these. But the magnetic vector potential was first given before Faraday had first even created his electromagnetic theory in 1845 by Franz Neumann in Germany. But we have to see that it's pretty much A, B, Cs. A stands for the magnetic vector potential field. The B field is the magnetic field, also with its um, permeability called uh, the H field. And then C stands for charge, and charge is electrically if, uh, rise to electrical field, so it's the E field. So A, B, and C is what you want to remember here. Unfortunately, we've left out the A, the potential. And that's very important, because the magnetic vector potential was called by Faraday the electrotonic state of matter. And Maxwell, who gave us this whole theory in the first place, held that the vector potential was the basis of electromagnetism. And using it, he said it's the tension within the ether, because he believed in the mechanical ether at the time. And he used quaternions to derive it, as we've seen. But this was thrown out by Heaviside, because it made hard work when you only used vector analysis in the equations. And Cyril Smith has studied this, as I'll show you, in imprinted water. He said, if you want to imprint information into water, it's the A field that does it, not the magnetic field. So we can visualize this very simply here. If you take a long wire and put a current through it, the vector potential travels in the same direction as the current. Well, there's actually no current traveling. There's just electrons sort of bouncing along the wire. But the magnetic field is in concentric circles around the wire. And if you want take that wire and wrap it into a solenoid, then the magnetic field is trapped within the magnetic uh, winding or the, uh, the wire winding. But the uh, vector potential then goes out as a series of concentric circles in that kind of field shape. It essentially controls the phase. Remember, phase, amplitude, and frequencies are the three characteristics of a wave. Uh, and also sometimes polarization. But the potentials control the wave function and the phase of the wave function. And that's very important because there's more information in the phases. As I mentioned earlier, other life forms like dolphins just communicate through phase information, not through frequencies. They have a whole different way of processing this information. So as I said, Cyril Smith said, if you take a magnetic vector potential of the A field and a magnetic field and combine them together, you can put frequencies into water. And it is the vector potential that determines the frequency that gets imprinted into the water. Ah, uh, Haleakala Canyon, another moment to spend some time in Hawaii. Well, we. <laughs> In Hawaii, in Hawaii, we contemplate our friends. 
Gibbs and Heaviside and recognized that modern physicists say we have to go to a larger theory of electromagnetism. This is called advanced electromagnetism, and Barrett and others have worked on this. And lest you get frightened of these equations, the only thing I want you to notice in here is that these new equations all use the magnetic vector potential now, incorporating into things like electric current density, magnetic current density, electric charge density, and so forth. So uh, we're making progress. We're coming back to the magnetic vector potential. And Bill Tiller, who's lectured here and many times, has done some experiments using what's called in intention imprinted electrical devices, where he set an intention into an electrical little oscillator working at micro power. And he said, I want to change water by, by one pH unit. I want to have an enzyme work faster. And lo and behold, he puts this into a conditioned space, and the space changes. So intention and thought can actually affect matter now with these new equations. But you have to use a new gauge symmetry. We can't use Maxwell's old equations. We have to use these newer Maxwell's equations. And he wrote about this in a book called Conscious Acts of Creation, the Emergence of a New Physics. So now we come into then finally what we can measure, electromagnetic force fields. And these are vector fields, because vectors are the only thing we can measure. Here's an example of the field around a charge. On the right, the field around a dipole. That's two charges separated. And you can see the field shape is different. But the scalar thing that I talked about, remember the scalar is part of quaternions, but the scalar in science is just defined of something that has no direction but has a magnitude. Like temperature, it's 57 degrees in this room. That's a scalar <coughs> measurement. You have a voltage of 1.5 volts on your AA cell. That's a scalar voltage. You see, vectors have direction. So you can have a scalar field. It has points in a field. Let's say a room has different temperature. It's warmer over there than over here. That's part of the scalar field. But it doesn't create any work, or it cannot be an energy transfer. For example, if you have electricity, you can have an electrical voltage. That's a scalar. But if you have a voltage over time, over a distance, that's volts per meter. That's the electric field. That's a vector. And you can see a human being would interact with the Earth's electricity or the Earth's electrical field by modifying it as part of the field. So what can we say about scalars then? Scalars are very difficult to understand because we can't really measure them. Here's a simplified partial explanation. You could say that when you have vectors that all balance each other, like people pulling on a rope and it's perfectly balanced, the rope doesn't move, everything seems frozen in time, but there's still people pulling. So vectors are balanced. And if we viewed this as superimposed, let's take over here an example. Let's take a scalar field be created by two waves. One wave is 180 degree out of phase. If they're exactly on top of each other, as shown on the top left, they cancel. That's called destructive interference. But if they add together, if they're in phase, then they add together. So here's sort of trying to make it visible. If you take waves and add the electromagnetic field where they are additively or constructively interfering, you create electromagnetic field moving forward. And where they cancel, the waves cancel, we say they just disappear. We can't measure it anymore. But that may be where the scalar field is. So if we were to put to these two fields and shift them by half a wavelength each time, notice the beautiful interference patterns that get created. The place where it's white is where the scalar field is. The place where it's darker is where we can measure it. This is basically used in antenna theory. If you want to direct a beam of electrical energy in a certain direction, all your microwave towers work like this. But we forget about the scalar field, you see. And the other thing to remember is you saw that beautiful earlier electromagnetic wave in the far field where the phases are together. Electricity vectors go up, magnetic vectors go horizontally, or in this case, the other way around. But notice that when you get closer to where you're radiating things out, the they are not in phase anymore. In fact, they actually create a vortex when they come off living systems. So we move from a vortex into this electromagnetic field in the far field. And that has important implications. Because if you stand near a radio transmitter and you go away, the power drops off very rapidly and the field strength decreases. But the magnetic vector potential, which has to do with the phase and the rotation, actually increases. And so we haven't considered that enough because we're only looking at power. We're only looking at heating of tissues. We're not looking at the magnetic vector potential. 
How would you create forces to study these? Well, you can wind coils in different ways where the windings cancel each other. And there's caduceus coils, there's bifilar windings. Or you can create a donut-shaped winding called a toroidal field. And uh, in this case, you can see that you will create a magnetic vector potential coming out the center of the donut. And this is what's been used in England by Mei Wan Ho following Cyril Smith's suggestions, because he studied this, how to imprint water. He said, why don't you study this on biological systems? And when she did, she put frequencies through a toroidal coil, and she had Drosophila fruit fly mutations taking place. So this magnetic vector potential can actually affect biological system in a very tangible way. Here's an example how to look what these fields look like. Um, toroidal wound coils look like this, and uh, you notice that the field is quite different depending on how you wind it. Here it's shown a little larger. It looks kind of fractal, doesn't it? It looks kind of like leaf fern structures and so forth. Well, back to our spiritual home as we move forward now. <laughs> So uh, one other thing about waves, and that is standing waves can be created, and wave packets travel when you have a whole bunch of frequencies that line up on top of each other, like an impulse. This is like what you did as a kid hitting a skipping rope. You can start seeing that if you have an impulse traveling, it has a wave packet like that. It's many frequencies all superimposed, called a Gaussian wave. And so these are what particles look like. There are many frequencies all interfering, creating the illusion of stability, but it's all waves. So I submit to you that acupuncture meridians, which have been studied for 2,000 or more years, we've never found an anatomical construct for them, but they may in fact be interference patterns of waves in our body that are coherent and that energy travels preferentially on. We can certainly manipulate them with acupuncture needles, but we don't really know what they are yet, and they are probably holographic wave interference patterns that create coherent information in the body. In fact, Cyril Smith studied acupuncture meridians and mapped out their frequency patterns using dowsing and other ways very accurately and repeatedly. And the interesting thing is the heart meridian has the same resonance as the Schumann frequency, the fundamental Schumann frequencies of seven frequencies that are between zero and 30 cycles a second of 7.8 hertz, which is the lowest Schumann resonance. So we're always connected to the Earth's heart, as we'll talk about in the post-conference intensive quite a bit more. One other thing about energy and information, just to show you that um, information and energy are two different things. Here is, um, I just want to show you a little example. Here is a speaker that has a photocell on the back. Here is light. You can see the light from these light emitting diodes. But they have, there's information on top of that. And if you, none of you are seeing the light change, but the light is being modulated. And that's information traveling on light, which we can now work with because probably by the time your children are grown, we'll all be illuminated not by these incandescent lights, which are very energy inefficient, but by LEDs, which will probably be able to have modulated information on it, both for good or for bad in the coming time. Well, coming back for a minute to uh, information and energy. Energy is really subtle information, and we are mostly used to the material stuff, and through E equals mc squared, energy and matter are interconnected. But information travels in your biological matrix and ultimately leads to physiological function. Um, and so if we were to plot information, which is more the opposite of entropy or disorder on the vertical axis, and energy, perfectly random energy, on the horizontal axis, then we could say that any temperature is the relationship in thermodynamics between entropy or information and energy. Now, if we say you are at 98 degrees, which is the slope of the curve there between energy and information, and you get a fever, what happens is you have increased energy for a while but decreased information. And then as you recover by recovering from your fever and getting back to normal temperature, your, your, te your temperature goes down again. Now what you see at the end, you might end up having more information and more energy incorporated into, into your system. And as a result of that, you've restructured your body. That's the function of fevers, immunological components, and getting more information structured into your body. 
And if you're aging, here's an example how to look at this. Your temperature goes down, then you recover. If you stay there, you'll stay with a loss of energy and a loss of information. That's called aging. This is how you would look at it thermodynamically. And the, the shorter arrow indicates, you know, the temperature is the same because temperature is a scalar, again, as I mentioned. Uh, and um, I've indicated here as an arrow, but it's not a vector. But let me just finish with water. Water is the element of life. And of course, our body is mostly made out of water. And water is the mystery that we're coming into. Now, we're coming into the age of the water bearer. We're coming into the Aquarian age, maybe in 100 years or so. We're at the end of the Piscean age. We're in a place where Aquarians like Nikola Tesla have been to create a new field consciousness here and even communicate, as we'll see tomorrow, with different devices called Tesla coils and so on. Well. The basis of energy medicine is the transport of electron excited states through the molecular protein complex. And this is essential to the biophysical nature of energy exchange. And since every molecule in your body that's a protein, primarily, which is the primary building block of your body, every protein in your body exists in a hydrated state, meaning it's surrounded by water. Therefore, water is one of the keys to understand the new energy medicine because it will unlock the secrets of energetic information in the body. Some people in England, like at the London University, have shown energetic molecular clustering, showing them as icosahedral structures. Interestingly, the Greeks thought that water was symbolized by the platonic solid called the icosahedron, made up of uh, 20 triangles. Um, and, but primarily, water is in the nature of a tetrahedron, which the Greeks used to think of as fire. And we learned yesterday from our Russian colleague that fire and water is the key to the future. And uh, it will be something that will become more apparent, probably work coming out of Russia right now. Well, the, the water has its own uh, hydrogen and oxygen in a polar combination, so we call it a dipole. So it radiates and absorbs electrical information back and forth through its electron structure. And they arrange themselves in little pyramids or tetrahedra. And they can link together like daisy chains or magnets all sticking together called water clusters. And these water clusters can hold information. At every cellular microstructure of your body, the protein that make up the skeleton, the cytoskeleton of your cells, which is called the microtrabecula, are surrounded by water. And that water is different than the free water. It's called bound water. And this is where information exchange takes place, again, using biophotons. If you put a, an ion in water, it tends to contract this field or this net, sort of shown here symbolically. But if you put an oxygen atom into this, then you create a hollow space, you might say that water is a diamagnetic substance. It doesn't like to concentrate the lines of force through it of magnetic flux. And oxygen is a paramagnetic substance. It likes to do it. So it changes the magnetic field in the water when you work with oxygen in water. Glenn Ryan did some interesting work by taking one of these scalar field generators called a caduceus coil and actually uh, creating a voltage um, difference, or a, sorry, a, uh, he measured a, a spectrum here in the UV range, in the ultraviolet range. And you can see that a caduceus coil, which caused field cancellation, had a higher peak spectrum in the ultraviolet than the control experiment. So you can say these fields can actually be somehow inferred by UV spectroscopy and others. And the late Dr. Uh, Wolfgang Ludwig in Germany used also a spectrometer. And he said, here is water in the ultraviolet region over here. And healthy water has this kind of spectral analysis. But water that is conditioned by electrical energies called electrosmog also, or electrical um, interference patterns, has a lower peak in the UV part of the spectrum. And if you, again, say this is control, then if you put water near chemicals, it changes its uh, spectroscope paddock pattern. If you put it in areas of geopathic stress, it's lower. Even putting it near a color monitor of your TV set or your computer will change water spectrum. Because water is infinitely information mediating. So the concluding thoughts <laughs> said uh, physics currently uses a limited set of electromagnetic equations. As we've seen, 
Uh, they may not have the most biological adaptability. We can certainly work with them technologically, but until we include the magnetic vector potential as part of it, we really won't understand fully how it works. Newer equations uh, are now being used by the more advanced physicists. Much of our research, therefore, may have only limited applicability because we look at things too much in a linear way, and living systems, as we found, are nonlinear. And by considering quantum fields or information in contrast to energy or subtle information, we may create the basis for a new energy medicine. So I hope that the 21st century will require us to rethink biophysics assumptions and create a new paradigm of living systems having greater wholeness and connectedness once again. And it is my hope that the future healing groups in energy medicine be composed of interdisciplinary teams from many fields of science, medicine, and the integral healing arts, working in a collective field of light because it is only through a consciousness of the group and the group holding the field that we can create a new energy medicine. Thank you very much. Thank you.